Hello, this is the second of what will probably be three videos on socialist and trade union responses to migration. Thing has to be looked at from both sides. Every migration has two sides. It's emigration and it's immigration. And in both cases, the socialist policies or communist policies are very controversial. If you think back a few decades, you'll realise that we have suppressed immigration, emigration. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended. So said Churchill. But why did we do this? What was the point of it? We had good economic reasons for it. First point is that socialist economies were more equal between people, more equal in terms of the levels of pay. Highly trained professionals earned little more or often less than heavy manual workers. They therefore had an incentive to emigrate westwards where differentials for the professional classes were greater or pro differentials for those with skills were greater. And it was obviously particularly in Germany that this became topical. The propaganda coverage about the Iron Curtain focused on Germany and focused on Berlin. This is the actual building of the Berlin Wall. Now why was Germany so important in this? The first point is that the DDR had a small population compared to the BRD. Why is small population important? Well, given that there was a common language, it was easy for the Bundesrepublik to institute a drain of skilled labour. They could easily absorb the much smaller quantity of skilled labour that there was available in East Germany. On the other hand, China was in a different position. When Nixon went over to China, he said to Zhou Enlai that you communists should let your people go free. And Zhou Enlai responded to him, how many hundred million peasants does the US want from us? Now, you only have to say that to realise what a difference size of countries makes and what hypocrisy it was on the part of Nixon to be talking about free movement. The last thing he would want was 200 million Chinese peasants arriving in the US. On the other hand, China could allow millions to leave and study in the West after the opening up with Nixon and still have a negligible impact on the Chinese workforce, given that it's so large. And if even half those return to China, and more than half return to China, they had gained valuable technical skills for the People's Republic. So the Chinese policy allowed a flow of skill into the country, and the DDR policy was designed to stop a flow of skill out of the country. In summary, socialist emigration policy is based on strategic economic considerations and this comes into conflict with the individual self-interest of people who might want to emigrate. But this is not something specific to the socialist bloc 
all states base migration policy on strategic interests. Now if we look at it from the other side, which is immigration. I'm going to cover four topics, two of them in this video, the other two in later videos. I'm going to look at what Marx had to say on immigration in the context of Ireland and England, and what Marx and the First International had to say on the topic of European migration into England. Later on, I will look at the line Marx took on foreign migration into France when he was drafting the programme of the French Socialist Party. And finally, I will look at how we can adopt or adapt these principles that he set out in the 19th century to the present. I'm quoting here from a letter he wrote in 1870 or 1871 to August Vogt and Siegfried Meyer in New York. He says, The English bourgeoisie has also a much more important interest in the present economy of Ireland. Owing to the constantly increasing concentration of leaseholds, Ireland constantly sends her own surplus to the English labour market and thus forces down wages and lowers the material and moral position of the English working classes. Marx continues, and most important of all, every industrial and commercial centre in England now possesses a working class divided into two hostile camps, Irish proletarians and English proletarians. Now, we can see in Scotland that this antagonism in the form of an antagonism between Catholics and Protestants, with the Catholics being descendants of Irish immigrants, remained politically potent until the mid-20th century. The Conservatives used to get a majority of Scottish seats until the 1950s due to their alliance with Protestantism. And the Labour Party was seen as the party of the Catholics, and the Irish, and it wasn't until the 1960s that the Tory dominance, based on this antagonism between the Irish and the Scots, was broken. Now, important things to note here is that Marx says Irish immigration really was depressing wages, and it was dividing the working class question is, what do you do about it? What response was he proposing? His solution, he said, was Irish independence from Britain. Why did he advocate that? Well, he said it would be a blow to the English aristocracy, the enemies of both working classes, and it would produce an agricultural revolution in Ireland and would enable the country to, to develop so there's no need to emigrate. His analysis was that the emigration was caused by rural poverty and the oppression of the peasantry by the English aristocracy. Now, was he right? Here you can see if we switch between these two pictures, there is a population density map at the time he was writing. And the darker the, the green, the greater the population. But the important thing to note is the population is widely spread. This is a modern population map. See, the population is overwhelmingly migrated into three conurbations. Now, Ireland won independence. There was an agrarian revolution. The country did urbanise and develop. In consequence, immigration to the UK declined and anti-Irish antagonism in England and Scotland greatly diminished and is no longer a significant feature in the politics of those countries. 
You can look at the comparative wages in Ireland and the UK now. Independent Ireland now has a median wage of €38,000. Britain has a median wage of €33,000. So the incentive to move from Ireland to Britain has been removed. He was right. Independence, urbanisation and development mean that low-wage immigration from Ireland ceased and is no longer an issue in British politics. It's a long-term process. You have to realise that the processes Marx talks about are not a few years long. He's talking about the long-term laws of economic development. Now, we can take some shorter-term examples. In things he said when he was in the First International. In 1866, faced with an attempt by the employing class in Britain to import low-wage labour, Marx issued the following proclamation on behalf of the International Workers' Association. He said, Some time ago, the London journeyman tailors formed a general association to uphold their demands against the London master tailors who are mostly big capitalists. It was a question not only of bringing wages into line with the increased prices of means of subsistence, but also of putting an end to the exceedingly harsh treatment of workers in this branch of industry. The masters sought to, re to frustrate this plan by recruiting tailors chiefly in Belgium, France and Switzerland. Thereupon, the secretaries of the Central Council of the International Working Men's Association published in Belgian, French and Swiss newspapers a warning which was a complete success. The London Master's manoeuvre was foiled. They had to surrender and meet their workers' just demands. Defeated in England, however, the Masters are now trying to take countermeasures starting in Scotland. The fact is that as a result of the London ev events, they had to agree initially to a 15% wage rise in Edinburgh. But secretly, they sent agents to Germany to recruit journeyman tailors, particularly in the Hanover and Mecklenburg areas, for importation to Edinburgh. The first group has already been shipped off. If the Edinburgh Masters succeed through the import of German labour in nullifying the concessions they have already made, it would inevitably lead to repercussions in England. No one would suffer more than the German workers themselves, who constitute in Great Britain a larger number than the workers of all other continental nations. And the newly imported workers, being completely helpless in a strange land, would soon sink to the level of pariahs. He went on to say, It is a point of honour with the German workers to prove to other countries that they, like their brothers in France, Belgium and Switzerland, know how to defend the common interest of their class and will not become obedient mercenaries of capital in its struggle against labour. On behalf of the General Council of the International Working Men's Association, Karl Marx. Again, Marx states that the organised migration of labour is a strategy that the of the capitalists against the workers. It's a deliberate strategy. And the obligation was on the foreign workers not to come if in so doing they would undercut wages and conditions. If the German workers ignore this appeal, they are threatened with direct action in the polite euphemism used by the International Workers Association, they're threatened with pariah status. What did pariah status mean? A report in the Northern Echo from 1866 makes this clear. George Stevenson, the leader of the Darling Master Tailors, recruited 15 German tailors and returned with them to Bank Chop on the 643 train. He placed them in a lodging house run by Mrs. Nelson, which, the moment his 
back was turned, was stormed by angry workers. They drove the Germans across the town until Mr. Stevenson found them sanctuary in a station hotel in Hopetown. Those who Marx labelled obedient mercenaries of capital got the standard reception of blacklegs. Now, the point to learn from these two examples where Marx was dealing with the issue of migration was he recognises it's a problem. He recognises that it's against the working class interest and comes up with two direct action responses. One is to support the Irish Revolution and the other is to support direct action by trade unions in Britain to prevent the importation of foreign labour. In my next talk, I'll get to the point where this is raised to the level of political demands in the, the programme of the French Socialist Party.